So I'm going to introduce you to the two the dragons of UX in Johannesburg. I really wanted to say that. Um, we've got Jason Hobbs and Terence Finn. Um, so just to give you a bit of background on, on both of these guys, uh, Terence is a full-time lecturer at UJ, and Jason is a part-time lecturer. They focus mainly on interaction design and information design, as well as design research. Um, it's a mouthful, but apart from that and traveling the world, whether it's Milan or Europe or presenting different communities, as I said earlier, they've got some keen personal interests as well. Um, Jason started the SA UX Forum um, in South Africa. So please go and look at that, uh, Google it. I'm not going to say Bing it because no one does that. Um, <laughs> Google it, please. Uh, SA UX Forum, join it. It's awesome, it's informative, and also it's an awesome medium to get all of these guys. Uh, Terence, <laughs> Terence, yeah, he's, he, he actually started as um, Fine Arts. That's uh, right. Yeah, he's got a background in Fine Arts. He's an avid Test Cricket fan, and uh, yeah, Test Cricket fan, or that. Um, and as well as that, he, he, the two of them present regularly. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jason and Tienis right now. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Jason and Terence, uh, I, I, so thank you to the organisers and um, uh, and thank you to Eric. Um, and, and I'm not sure if Eric is here, but I really loved his boots. They were really cool, but check this shit out. Check that. It's like a whole different Joburg style. All right, so um, <clears throat> the FIRMA model, Meta Framework for Design Research Strategy and Critique. Uh, what are we talking about? So user experience design or user-centered design? What is user experience design if it's not doing some or a bit of user-centered design, if we're not engaging with people to understand and to test and get feedback and all these sorts of things. If we're talking about user-centered design, well then, what's, what's the difference between user-centered design and human-centered design? Are we saying one thing is digital, one thing's not digital? Uh, and is there not some kind of common thread that, that lies underneath, um, beneath both of them? There's a kind of a continuum that, that, that we understand between UX design, service design, and design thinking as, as practices, which is this, this human-centered, user-centered bit. It's the thing that they share in common. But they, they tend to operate in different domains. Uh, UX kind of digital, sometimes going beyond that, service design, uh, services broader, total ecosystem thinking, design thinking, radical innovation, stuff like that. Okay, so, so what should we be doing? When should we be doing it? What's the difference? Am I doing it already? And what do they look at, right? If you're doing the one thing and somebody says, I need you to solve a problem to do X, uh, what should I be applying? Okay, so this is actually more than semantics. And it, it does matter. And the reason why it matters is because of the way that we frame stuff, the way, the way we set stuff up, influences everything that comes afterwards, particularly when it comes to dealing with very, very complex problems. So a few examples. Um, we've been looking for a cure for, for HIV and AIDS since the 80s, and, and we failed. We, we, we still do not have a cure for HIV and AIDS. And what's interesting, though, is that we do kind of have a solution, right? The solution is antiretrovirals plus um, uh, education and, and well-being. With that, we can, we, can, we can contain this thing. We can, we can control it. There's a solution, but not a cure. And it makes me wonder, had we looked at this as a social and, and health and food uh, issue, and not just as a scientific problem sooner, could we have kind of reached the point and saved so many lives uh, sooner? It's a question. Another one, uh, the xenophobic violence that we're seeing at the moment. Is this an issue about uh, South Africans hating other Africans, foreigners? Or is it an issue of economics, lack of jobs? So how are we framing this thing? Or if we take something uh, like crime is out of control in South Africa. Okay, crime is out of control. Let's, let's unpack this. Okay, so uh, 
Possibly ineffective schooling creates uh, a lack of industry skills, which is creating mass unemployment and therefore crime. Okay, maybe. Or could it be poor pay for police officers leads to poor quality recruits, recruits which leads to ineffective policing? Right, so how are we framing these things? How are we looking at them? It makes a huge difference to how we then start solutioning. So if we take this idea of framing literally, right, as in the framing of, of a photograph, there's something really nice that, uh, this is Susan Sontag, and she wrote about, she was one of the, one of the first people to, to step away from this idea that the photograph is a, doc, is a piece of documentary evidence, that light hitting film therefore creates a representation or a moment of truth. She was saying, no, this is, this is not the case, that photographers compose their images. And that in that act of composition, a different story is told. What is left in the frame, what is kept out of the frame. This photograph was also taken by Annie Leibovitz. Um, and here is one of Annie Lieber Leibovitz's photographs for Vogue magazine. And it's really cool because it makes the point about composition. She's telling a story about feminism, right, through a photograph. It's almost got nothing to do with what is actually in the picture. So from a research perspective, you know, you will get the answers uh, that you want from the questions you ask. But the question, you know, we know this. Um, are you asking the right question? So if we jump back to the UX service design design thinking thing, the UX question might be uh, for, an, for a banking project. Uh, how do people make payments online? The service design question might be how do people make payments? And the design thinking question might be how do people bank? And you're going to get a totally different picture out of these different views. And probably one of the main reasons is actually because users don't make the distinct distinctions that we do, right, between digital or not. And, and this and many other things, um, both internally to organizations and as the designer, these, these categories, these framings that we, that we put ourselves in. And the biggest problem is, this, is what Terence and I refer to as assumptive design. So assuming what the outcome should be because of an implicit framing and interpretation of what the problem is, creates assumptive design, right? So we're asked to design uh, an app or a website and we do our research and we find out that that's not the issue. The issue is a, is a process or a pricing policy or a piece of messaging or something like that, but we've got to deliver a website. So assumptive design is, is an issue. Okay, so what's the real problem that, that, that we have here? Complexity arises when we adopt a humanistic approach that situates design problems in society and when we start to remove assumption. This complexity is an important challenge to address in contemporary design practice. You like this? Like you were gonna say something? Okay. Um, we, we, we feel that we, that we lack tools to assist in that initial problem framing, that, that big picture view. How do you know that you've researched all the stuff that you have? How do you know that you've framed it correctly? When do you stop doing the research, et cetera, et cetera. There's a blurriness there that we, that we think designers need help with. Um, that, that we need big picture models that appreciate unexpected stakeholders. So we might define the stakeholders as those people, but in the wild, when we broaden out that framing, it could be other stakeholders that we just haven't considered. Um, in that context, how do we critique design? If you're not entirely sure of that framing, where, how do you then critique it? And, um, and we also lack models to assist in tracing design solutions back to that initial framing, right? Where is that traceability? So without this stuff, um, we're at risk. Obviously, a faulty framing will result in a faulty solution. This can result in lengthy, iterative cycles where we stumble blindly for what the solution could or should be. Um, Although we emphasize uh, uh, the user, the business, and the context of use, uh, other stakeholders can impact on these framings and solutions. And critique without this broad view suffers the same challenges as we've exactly just said. So what we're really looking for is, is something which sits in the background, as in meta, a framework behind a method or, or another framework. So in the foreground, we've got research, ideation, and prototyping, very generalized way of speaking about the design process. But in the background, what we're looking for is something that can act as a model for research, a model for change, and a model for critique that can stay present all the way through the design process. So 
Um, this is why we call it a meta framework. So common areas of exploration when we do our projects, we'll look at the user and the business. And it's often about this thing of how can we uh, align and marry those needs. We often say if we've created a harmony between user needs and business needs, then, then, then it's cool. Then, then we've done this kind of UXE job. We look at the marketplace, do competitor analysis, those sorts of things, and we, we look at context of use. We do some ethnography, we go and look at what the reality of the physical and technological environment actually is. Okay, to jump back to this metaphor of the idea of composition, um, if we look at a painting, this one, by Claude Lorraine, I think, um, it's broken up into foreground, middle ground, middle ground and background. Okay, so where can we situate some of those previous elements? Okay, foregrounded, user, business, marketplace. Maybe somewhere in the background, the context in which this plays out, context of use, environment. So Terence and I wanted to go beyond this and, and look for models uh, that might exist out there that, that speak more broadly uh, uh, to this larger problem ecology space to assist us with framing. Um, the first one that sprang to mind is, is pest analysis or pestle analysis um, in the earlier version. So looking at political, economic, socio-cultural and technological issues. In some of the work that we had done previously, this is an image from a, from a paper that we wrote, uh, we started looking at users of which multiple identities, politics, aspirations, values, economics, etc. Um, oh, don't know how to finish that sentence. Hold, uh, produce a data mass in the middle, which is um, a real problem for the designer. Um, so we, 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 we took the thinking further and we started saying, okay, so what do, what do we call these things? They're, they're not categories, uh, they're not factors. They're, so we decided to call them areas of concern, okay? Intentionally kind of loose. And we broke those into immediate contextual and paradigmatic areas of concern. And within these, we had, in immediate, the organization, users, the marketplace, and the legacy of the problem as it is framed initially. In contextual areas of concern, we have the environment, physical and technological, and society. And in paradigmatic, economics, politics, culture, and history. And then to jump back to the metaphor, well, then we're starting to look at our background being politics, economics, culture, and history, the middle ground, environment, and society, and the foreground, the user business marketplace and legacy. So if we represent it like this, with environment and society in the middle, it's kind of like the immediate areas of concern have a top-down influence, and the paradigmatic areas of concern have a bottom-up influence, um, where society in environment is where those things play out. Right? That's where society exists and feels the effects of the stuff that goes on in those different spaces. Um, if we then look at this thing, the triangle from above, creates a spiral, which is quite cool. Get it? Uh, and from there, right, so in the middle, we've got, we've got the immediate areas of concern, then contextual and paradigmatic, and the, the kind of final working version of what we're looking at kind of looks something like this. So this is the FEMA model as it stands at the moment. Okay, a few more last points. Um, <coughs> It tends to be the case that the kind of data that we get from uh, the immediate areas of concern is quite narrow, but very, very deep. We get a lot of data from that. Stuff at the bottom, broad, but kind of quite shallow, and the stuff in the middle, in the middle of a kind of a, a, a medium density. And this is just what we've experienced in our, in our research. So let me go through a little bit more detail on the, of the three different moments that, that the model plays out in. Um, first for research, then for strategy, and then for critique. In terms of research, what, what we're trying to do is we're, it's a bit like a detective novel, right? So you are moving through a world where you're picking up different clues as you go along, where only at a certain point in time do, does it all kind of come together and it, it becomes apparent that it was Mr. Mustard with the chandelier in the toilet or whatever it might be. Um, and so what we're trying to do is build a relational logic between these different elements to tell the story of the problem ecology. This thing that we're talking about is synthetic in nature rather than analytical. The stuff that we're looking to engage with is paradox, conflict, and contradiction. Those sorts of things start telling us that we are actually dealing with something that is truly complex. 
And the other is that we want to acknowledge assumption. Obviously, you can't always deal with all of these issues. But when you are bringing your assumption, that kind of self-reflectiveness in the process is really important to try to be documented. But the idea is something like, OK, so we do a bunch of research, and we, we determine that the problem is something in the space of a process in the organization, uh, a problem that exists in somebody's home, and a kind of cultural aspect, for argument's sake. Just saying this so I can create a little story through the description. So, other ways to use the model in this phase, you can use the FEMA model to plan your research activities. Are we ticking all the boxes to ensure that we've got a nice broad view? Uh, it can be used as a tool for multi-stakeholder engagement in workshops, get people who represent those different areas to come together to work. Uh, it can assist with um, categorizations for, for data mapping and tagging. And it can also be used as a, a, a kind of a research gap analysis. So moving into the model as it stands for strategy, it might be a result that we kind of look at this and sort of go, okay, we understand that the problem is somewhere between the organization, the environment, and culture, but the solution is, okay, well, let's, let's fix that process. Let's give people something that they can put in their home, but there's an economic thing that needs to be enabled to make this happen, right? As opposed to kind of, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping, like what the problem is is what the strategy is. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, but from a strategic point of view, it's very, very obvious. So, it, you know, knowing what the problem ecology looks like allows us to say, look, why is the problem a problem and for whom? And it presents a kind of a theory for change and it provides the framing for ideation, of course. So, at the ideation level, it's kind of like, yeah, we want to be looking at these things. We can't touch culture because that's not going to change as a result of our design process, but these other things might give us the solution we want anyway. So some of the ways that we can use it, so um, uh, for guiding and enriching ideation through, for example, facilitated co-design workshops, or the validation of ideas as prototypes in testing under conditions that are reflective of the problem ecology. So in terms of critique, um, one of the key things that it, that it does, which is really useful, is it, is it can start to allow us to identify first when unintended con consequences are occurring and where they might be occurring because we have this kind of, this mental map um, of what that problem ecology looks like. Um, obviously, it allows us to know where to look to, to kind of understand impacts uh, of change. And um, it's totally consistent with uh, other methods of, of measurement and, and understanding impact that can fit into the model. But I guess the key thing is that what we hope, because it exists across the, the designing um, life cycle is that it provides the traceability, sustainability, and accountability, which are so important if you are going to be doing human-centered or user-centered design, where your agenda is making people's lives better on some level. Other ways that you can use it, um, you can use it to critique work that you were not involved in. Uh, you can use it to apply across multiple projects that are dealing with the same issue, like a design competition or working uh, to cross-analyze projects that are on a similar topic but from radically disparate environments. So you might be looking at critiquing um, public transport solutions from New York, Lagos, and Warsaw. And it, it can start doing some quite interesting things for that kind of mapping. Now that I've brought Terence to tears, he's going to give a case study of where he applied this. OK, hi, good morning. Um, if I appear nervous, it's not that I am. I actually just had to run up those stairs like a <laughs> Okay, so the case study that I'm going to talk about is a project I did last year. And I was working with, uh, it was a co-design project working with farmers in Soweto, such as Mr. Shabalala in picture. Um, the kind of focus of the project was helping to better enable the access, the farmer's access to information. Um, in terms of how we actually went about our business, uh, the methodology that I employed, the main me methodology, uh, was context mapping, which is a form of co-design. Um, in context mapping, we apply a little method called generative tools. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this process, but what we really do is we ask the participants, uh, we give them materials, art traditional art materials, and we give them a, a, a pseudo brief, and we ask them to like respond to the brief by creating things. Um, so in this case, we asked them to make a collage explaining how they got to be farmers and how they continue to improve their knowledge of being farmers. Then I also gave them uh, 
The, the second task was using clay and asking them to model if they could create anything in the world to help them be better farmers, what would they make? Um, so in this, in, in this slide above, um, as you can see, the, this farmer would really like a computer on wheels with adjustable arms and what looks like a frog's foot. Um, what the, the, the key idea behind generative tools is not so much that we're going to look at the artifacts, but to get the actual the, the participants to then talk and explain why they made their, um, the products the way they did. And this is really where the data comes into play, and this is where you get the rich descript descriptions and the rich data um, that, you, that I, as a designer, could then use to sort of structure my response. So I, I recorded all of it, and I took it, and I turned it into uh, sticky notes in the traditional way. This I originally started doing in my kitchen, which was kind of cool because we ran out of space. But then we could do things like keep all the information about food in the fridge, or the, all the information about implements in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> implement store, etc. But then it got a bit like strange when my wife wanted to start cooking and I had to say uh, <laughs> I had to move back to work to do this. Um, so basically what I did through the categorization is I came up with a number of probably quite uh, common sense categorizations such as what kind of information the farmers really needed, uh, how they were currently accessing information, what was particularly interesting about this, uh, which was an assumption that was broken for me, is most of them used the internet, um, which seemed strange, uh, I think, before when we started this project. Um, another kind of categorization we did was relating to um, psychological needs. And for each one of these psychological needs, uh, we further categorized that in terms of the data. Along with the um, data that we got from the users, we obviously, we also looked at a lot of um, literature on the subject. So the, the result of all, all the data collection was actually really a lot of complexion and a lot of these kind of traditional IA kind of like sort of representations of insights, which is all very well for us working here, but I had to go as it was a co-design project. There was a strong emphasis on me as a designer to go and go back to the participants and to communicate with them to see if I had actually understood their experiences and their information correctly. And to a guy like Mr. Shabalala, those kind of uh, diagrammatic drawings were not necessarily that easy to understand. So what I decided to do was then put the information into, into our model uh, and use that uh, to go back to them and to talk about the particular areas. Now, as you can see there, that's a little bit too small for most people to read. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, just to give you a little bit of context of some of the information that we collected, I'm just going to quickly give you a summary of a summary for each area. Um, it's not the same as the other diagram, it's just the point. So, you, so, you know, it, the other diagram was that circular thing, and so the, the point is, you know, you've got history and culture and the paradigmatic stuff right on the edge, and then the other stuff kind of in the middle, and then, but it's laid out differently. It's just, Point. Thanks, Jason. Uh, <laughs> and I, I really added that. <laughs> and I think the key yeah. thing that which we also learned by doing this was like sort of originally we probably had environment just at a very broad layer. And what I really found is like particularly seeing like sort of the difference between the physical, the habitat, and the technological environment became quite important to me in terms of like thinking about um, how to understand the information. So just quickly back to the brief overviews. If we look at history, which I think for most of us we're probably quite aware that like a lot of the, the, the history of Soweto is like sort of, is definitely like sort of uh, controlled by apartheid and also that there's a lot of these communities are historically poor living in Soweto. Um, in terms of economy, uh, the, there's also, it's, it's like that the farmers really saw themselves as part of the Soweto economy. Um, but they also saw themselves as being farmers, part of a larger economy, and that was really probably where, where, the, where quite a vast problem lay, is they, they struggled to access the economy um, outside of the local economy. Um, in terms of culture, um, it was, it, it was uh, farming is very much a, a common heritage, um, so most of them knew how to farm, but as, as you'll see later on, there's also problems attached to that. Um, other things that emerged, uh, strong oral, uh, tradition. So to the younger members of the audience, a strong oral tradition really refers to people talking and having meetings. 
Okay. Um, politics, and I think politics really talks to about that local politics in South Africa in terms of service delivery is really in a, in a sorry state. Um, society, I think the key point here is farmers were not see, perceived as being valuable to their community. In fact, one of the farmers told me like quite an interesting insight where he, he said that they were regarded as worse than unemployed people because they were seen as being dirty, working in the earth, and they were like kind of too stupid to just actually stay at home and get their, their, their benefits, which I think is quite like a sad um, representation. Um, physical environment, um, obviously this is also divided into sort of two key areas. One is that actual, how it is a difficult job to be a farmer. Nature is generally always against you. But also that being in Soweto, there's a lack of infrastructure, which also makes it very difficult to access external markets. Um, what was very interesting to me is like sort of their use of technology. And I think particularly here, I'm talking about technology in terms of digital technology. Um, that quite, it was quite common for them to do things like online banking. Um, they really liked using Google. That was their favorite thing in the world. Um, they hate browsing because they say browsing costs too much. Uh, so they don't like looking for data, they wanted to come, they, or for information, they wanted to come straight to them. Um, interesting about most farmers, they probably were part of the black middle class uh, until they lost their jobs. So they're not, they're, they're not like, and this is maybe a stereotype which, or an assumption that many of us may believe, is a lot of these farmers were not poor or uneducated. A lot of them are actually quite well educated. Um, their organization, um, they're very strong, they've got strong social connections, they're self-organized, but however that self-organization is not always effective. Um, the marketplace, again, this is about who they sell to, but it's also about probably the threats that they face as farmers. And these two, probably the two strongest threats is commercial farming, and the other one is almost education in the communities Unhealthy food is a lot cheaper than healthy food. So they often try to have to educate the local community as to why they should be buying healthy food. And then of course, the farmers themselves, where a lot of them were form formally educated, uh, family providers, relate well to each other, and aspire to be better farmers and enjoy learning. So what, going back to the firmer model, and having this done, and having them all around and looking at this, just by having a context sheet so they could see the different information and how it related. And also by going through it and talking about it, it really helped to not only change, because I had often certain views or things that I understood as part of my research process that I put in there and they could actually look at it and they could change it and they could inform it. So as a communication tool, it worked really well. And the discussion actually allowed us collectively to really start to define what was most important and what we could solve. Um, so I'm just going to really blow this up, if rather awkwardly, and to say these are the key areas that we could bring extract out of that model. <coughs> from, this, from, from this kind of stage, again, we could talk about these areas, and we could start seeing a pattern forming. And this pattern actually went straight into the strategy, that we could actually see these are the key things that we could address collectively as the farmers and myself as the designer. And this actually allowed me to put this together as my strategy model, mm -hmm. where, as you can see, it really puts the farmer in the middle, but it says in order for them, these are the problems that need to, in terms of our solution, we need to try uh, improve. So the, the top one, improving uh, farm, actual farming ability, so how to be a better farmer. To the left in the red, or my left, everyone's, um, <laughs> business, so that they can actually be better at farming business. And on the, yellow, on the right, the yellow one was quite an interesting one, which was about co-value co creation. And this was about them working together as a community of farmers, but also spreading the word within the community why farming was valuable. Um, on the periphery of that circle is also like the, the whole idea that whatever this product, this, whatever the solution was going to be, it was an enabling structure. It wasn't going to replace current good practice. So that's how, so we managed to collectively get to this point. And I think what was very interesting is, this, is the farmers themselves could buy into this, this strategy and could see how it would work. Um, and in terms of the model, so going forward from the actual ability to communicate around the model, it also really kind of said that although we had distilled all the data and all the thinking into a strategy, 
that strategy was still very much uh, contextual and related to the rest of the data. And this also became true when we sort of, when we uh, concreticized the strategy into the actual solutions. So the eventual product, uh, or part, well, the main, the main product that we, I eventually ended up designing was a mobile app to allow them to access information. Um, so what you can see is a very like a bird's eye view of the various user journeys in terms of how the different farmers and trainers would use the app. So I've just blown it up a bit. <coughs> And this is really, I'm not going to give too much of an, it's just going to be a very simple overview. But the kind of the, 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 the features that I brought into this app would be things like learning about farming in Soweto, learning the value of farming, um, sharing knowledge, uh, identifying what to plant when, learning about plants, identifying natural threats such as insects and, and diseases, um, Learning more about uh, if you have crops to avoid wastage, how you can make secondary products such as jams um, and chilies. Uh, evaluating the viability of a crop to see if you're making if you're making something, can you sell it to make a profit? Um, creating a, a, and viewing informa information related to farms and crops on a profile. So other people working in the farming communities such as the NGOs, such as the trainers could actually see which far what farmers were growing and to see if they couldn't actually bring crops together and like sort of uh, collaborate in selling and, and, and taking crops to market. So the final the final application, as you can see from the, the numbers related to just this is just the the a mock up of the interface, as you can see that all that data moving into strategy has it directly relates in terms of the features we built into the app. Um, and so, as, as you can see, up until this stage, although we had worked very closely together, this was still very much a um, my hypothesis of what the solution would be. And it was actually quite interesting because only, you know, in terms of all these, in terms of all design, at, at the end of the day, you're always only hoping and hypothesizing based on some kind of like sort of on your instinct and what you've learned from the process in terms of what will actually be the solution. And I mean, when we actually went to test it, uh, that will, where, that's when we got the final affirmation. What, what, what became very interesting about this as well is also in testing, by using this model and by using this, this golden thread or this traceability, we could also identify if something had gone wrong in the design, that we could trace it back to our ecology to see exactly where the problem lay. Uh, if we had to resolve it, the iterations. Back to you. Cool. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to wrap up, really. I mean, we, we, we're, we've got plenty of time, so we can maybe play a game afterwards. But um, what, what, for us, as, as, because Terence and I um, have a focus on um, theory, practice, and, and education, that's really important to us. So. We teach and then we practice design and we write academic papers and stuff. So you know, this idea of this kind of model thing um, without some kind of educational component would, would be really problematic for us. So um, we're starting to work on teaching modules uh, uh, for this. This year was the first year that we got our students to start experimenting with going through their research phases um, using the model. These are some of examples of, of some of the student work um, uh, and how they were starting to kind of look at look at their mappings. And this is great how different they are. Um, other another kind of application is is uh, using the model as a as a kind of a, pr a tool for self reflection for the designer. So kind of imagine. Uh, mapping yourself into the model and using that to generate a persona of yourself. Like, what is your history? What are your politics? What is your stance on economics? What type of a user under different circumstances might you be? Um, where do you sit in society? And going through that process, it's actually, it's actually, well, maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'm just an idiot. But for me, it was really hard. It was kind of like, geez, what, well, okay, well, what, what is my economic stance? And where do I fit economically into things? It became really interesting when I went through the process uh, myself. I'm trying to draw it out now. Um, 
And then uh, some other stuff that we're doing is we are uh, doing a mapping. This is just a work in progress, and it's meant to be small. You're not meant to be able to read it because it's a total mess. But mapping in uh, uh, different research uh, uh, methodologies into the different categories. So, and that's turning into a nightmare as well, because this whole space of uh, research and research techniques in design is actually uh, so uh, is actually a bit of a nightmare. Like there, we call the same technique different things a lot of the time. Uh, certain things which are techniques are not really techniques, or like uh, the five whys, or you know, is it what's the difference in the five whys and laddering? No, same thing. Okay, is that actually a technique, or is interviewing and qualitative interviews the technique? No, well, it's something you do inside. And you start looking at it, it's a total dog show. So uh, we want to try and um, uh, look at that and, and, um, and see what comes out of that. Also, it's quite interesting because you end up with a different kind of set of categories, um, where a lot of different research methods start, you can start taxonomically speaking, start sitting under generative tools or uh, some other form of, of research and then that's kind of useful because then you can start thinking are you ticking the boxes kind of one level deeper than kind of saying okay we did some uh, qual and some quant and stuff like that so we're hoping that as a result of this that'll be quite interesting and then looking at techniques that again can be mapped uh, into the strategy and, and critique stage so hopefully this will bear fruit in other ways and, and be really useful to people um, and we'll publish about it and 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 write that stuff in a, up in a more academic way. So, uh, in conclusion, Terence, your case study was awesome, and I love you. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, a humanistic approach to design should place, should place improving people's lives individually and collectively at the heart of its ambition. Design also requires that these solutions are accountable and sustainable. And it is our hope that this model goes some way in contributing to this effort. Thank you.